I mean, the channel is called 52 Cues, but I've also gone on record and said that you need hundreds and hundreds of cues placed across all these different libraries in order to make a living at this. Or, or, am I saying that after 10 years, you can make a living with just 520 cues? I mean, it kind of begs the question, is one cue per week really enough? Well, yes. And then, no. And then, yes. Confused? Well, that's okay, because today I'm going to unpack and illustrate how productivity and output might not quite be the linear journey we think it is. Plus, we're going to listen through the latest submission in my year of taxi, follow up on any returns or forwards, and feature a cue written by a member of the 52 Cues community on this week's episode of the 52 Cues podcast. What is happening, everybody? This is Dave Croft, and welcome back to another episode of the 52 Cues podcast, a weekly podcast dedicated to all things production and library music, where we talk about industry topics and take deep dives into the different aspects of being a working production music composer. Plus, we take a listen to the latest submission in my year of taxi and check in on any forwards and returns. And this week, we're going to check in on Waltz of Shame, a quirky dramedy cue featuring Slide Whistle. And I've heard back about last week's entered into evidence. So we're going to check in on that. And then a little later, we're going to take a listen to a funky heist cue written by 52 Cues member Dex Williams. So you definitely, definitely want to stick around for that. If this is your first time here, welcome. I'm so glad to have you with me. I know you have a ton of options out there, whether you're watching on YouTube or listening to the audio podcast on the go. I just want to thank you for spending part of your day here with me. I also want to give a special word of thanks to the family, friends, and patrons of 52 Cues who help keep the podcast, the channel, and everything we do here going. We are 100% community supported, so if you like what I do here, don't thank me, thank them. But if you want to learn more about how you can help support 52 Cues and also unlock extra perks like live streams, workshops, uh, Zoom feedback sessions, and a ton more, and be sure to click on the links in the description or stick around because we're going to be talking more about that a little bit later in today's episode. So it's time for my year of taxi check-in and I'm happy to report, I'm thrilled to report that Entered Into Evidence, which was the cue we listened to last week, has actually already gotten a forward. So uh, thank you, Screener403, which parenthetically 403 was, was somebody who returned a cue uh, last year, but that that's all right. I, it is what it is. I don't, I don't, I don't hold it against you, but thank you 403. And the feedback was, uh, hi Dave. I like the subtle arrangement and the development of this investigative tension cue. I think the song could improve by nice use of dynamics. Good work. And I returned to forwarded the song. So it was a forward. This song meets the listings request. So, so thrilled about that. Thrilled to report that I've gotten my first forward. And so I was able to move it from the submitted bin into the forward bin here in Asana and was really excited about that. Well, this week I am working on a quirky dramedy cue called that, I, that I've titled Waltz of Shame, and they are looking for a well-composed dramedy instrumental cues that could add humor and lighthearted energy to lightly dramatic scenes in reality TV shows like Real Housewives. Quirky motifs, engaging arrangements, and plenty of dynamics, interest, and forward motion are all needed by this request. Top-notch orchestral instrumentation in the general wheelhouse of the references will suit your submissions best. Please be sure your production is polished and any virtual sounds or sampled uh, samples you use are high quality and realistic sounding. So they're looking for about two minutes. Don't copy the references, exclusive deal, 50-50, blah, 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 boilerplate, boilerplate. So this was actually one of the briefs that I looked at last week during the, uh, you know, read the bleeping brief episode. And what I knew I needed, I knew I needed lots of space in the instrumentation I knew that I needed good sounds and I needed something quirky. So, uh, if see, see if you can pick out pick out the quirky uh, the quirky instrument. Here here is uh, here is Waltz of Shame.
that is uh, that is not a musical saw, nor is it a theremin. It is a cheap, cheap plastic slide whistle that I picked up on Amazon when I had to do a, a musical, and uh, the percussion book called for slide whistle, and uh, and I threw it in there. And I did this really crazy vibrato, like, like really, really out there vibrato and uh, pushed it kind of into theremin territory. And it sounds like a musical saw, a bowed musical saw. They're either going to love it or they're going to hate it. But I, I'm going to die on that hill because that slide whistle, it pulled the uh, the title together, you know, because I it was just a dramedy title. And then when I did that slide whistle, I, I thought to myself, this... It sounds kind of like a like a drunk person, like kind of. Oh. And then you know, I thought I thought about you know the the walk of shame, you know that that when when people having made some questionable decisions the night before, the next morning they try to gather their belongings, grab their shoes, and sneak out of the house. Right again after a night of questionable decisions, and the, so that's the walk of shame. And so because it's in three four. I called it the Waltz of Shame. Uh, so, 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 yeah. If you want to see a full breakdown of this cue, including you know uh, isolating that slide whistle and being able to hear that, that is uh, available to the friends and family subscribers at Fifty Two Cues. So we'll see. We'll see if they dig it. Maybe I'll know by this time next week. That would be great if we can get a, a one a one week turnaround. That will keep that will keep this cooking along. But uh, we'll see. Again, either they're gonna love it. Or they're gonna hate it. So that is uh, that is this week's check in, uh, this week's check in on the the year of taxi week two. So this week I want to revisit something that we've touched on before, which is productivity output quality over quantity. Is fifty two cues really really enough? Now, as a reminder. The idea of 52 cues comes from Dan Graham's book, A Composer's Guide to Library Music, where he talks about how you can create and have a very good career focusing on just writing one cue a week. And then I extrapolated that into one cue a week, 52 cues a week, or 52 cues a year, 52 cues, and, you know, here we are. But that's not really the whole story. Because... When Dan is talking about 52 cues, when he's talking about one cue a week, the idea is that every cue you're writing is not only getting published, but it's also probably making air. And that doesn't happen overnight. It doesn't happen right away. So I I want to, I want to, I've got my little pen out. I'm going to go full teacher on a whiteboard here. And I just want to present to you what I kind of call the productivity bell curve. And, um, and Shannon Shannon offered to make me a very, very beautiful graphic. And I was like, you know what? I, may, I think I just want to write. I think I just want to draw. So uh, my apologies for my handwriting. Just going to go ahead and let you know that uh, that this is, this is full-on Professor Dave mode here on a whiteboard, except it's digital and I got my little pen. And... My apologies if you're listening to this on on the audio. Uh, I will um, I'll do my best to narrate as I'm going. But this is the productivity bell curve, and the idea is at the beginning, you start by writing one cue a week, and then by the end, you are writing one cue a week. Okay, and this could take several years. So when you are starting writing at the beginning of your career, you don't know anything necessarily. You might know a lot about music. You might know about composition, but you don't know a lot about production music. You don't know about form, structure. You don't know what editors want. And so writing one cue a week at the beginning is very challenging. And it's almost like you can barely write one cue a week. You're lucky if you can force one cue out of your muse in one week because you're learning a lot. You're making a lot of mistakes. And that's okay. You're supposed to. And that's where we start. So 52 cues is for you. 
starting with one cue a week as you're learning. But as you move up the mountain here, up the bell curve, now suddenly we're no longer having to, to focus as much on things like form and structure. We know what edit points are. Our, our mix is becoming, uh, the, the mixes are getting better. We're not having to guess our way through our mastering chain. And as we're moving up here, now we're doing maybe two cues a week. And then maybe a few months later, three cues a week, maybe four cues a week. And this could take, this could take, I don't know, this could take a year. This could take two years. This whole area here could take two years and that's all right. But what's happening, the more you learn about the industry, the faster you get it, you get at producing. And so it's not about quantity over quality because it's in the doing, in the repetition, in the practice that begets quality until eventually you reach this area, kind of at the top of the hill here, <laughs> where you might be writing five, six, seven, maybe eight cues a week, cranking them out. Talk to somebody in our mastermind just this week who had written nine cues in one week. So in this whole top of the mountain, you might be writing anywhere between, let's just say five to 10, and 10's intense. When I am firing on all, on all cylinders, then I, I, I averaged the last two years, three cues a week, but there were seven cues per week weeks, and there were also zero cue weeks. <laughs> That's fine. And I'm not even saying you have to have five to 10 cues a week. And this isn't the goal. This is just, this is just my observation. My fastest or my biggest week was 13 cues. That's my record, my personal record. 13 delivered cues. Now, for the record, that wasn't 13 cues from scratch. That was 13 cues, which all came together at once. And all I was able to deliver, that was 13 cues delivered in one week. I think there were probably nine cues that I wrote from scratch that week. And that was, that was intense. There were no lessons. There were no live streams. Yeah, that, that was intense. And I got to say, I felt like a dried out sponge on the other side of that. I don't recommend it necessarily. And this might take, you know, another two to maybe three years of cranking out five to 10. Because at this point, at this point, we are getting libraries, right? That's what we're doing at the top of the crest here. We're, 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 we're seeding our cues out. We're, we're, we're pitching we are finding the relationships which are really going to work for us. That means there are going to be some false starts, and that's totally fine. That means there are going to be some libraries that will take a bunch of stuff and not do much with them. That's all right. Because we're learning how to write these, we'll just, we'll just make more. We'll just make more. Not art, folks. Now, obviously, when you're on the kind of the, the leeward side of this curve, you're pushing against, you're, you're learning how to write, you're learning how to form everything, you're learning about instrumentation, you're learning about all the different genres, and you're also networking and looking for, looking for libraries. So here at the beginning, you're doing a lot of writing kind of for yourself in the hopes of landing gigs. But you get in with, two or three libraries, and then the traction starts kicking in. And now not only are they helping you get placements, but they're also taking like literally whatever, whatever you will give them. 
I have four libraries that I work with right now that are like that. They will literally take whatever I give them and as much as I give them. And I think three of those four get me regular placements. One is a rel- relatively newer to me. And uh, yeah, I, I, I trust the people that are, uh, that are running it. And so they, they are absolutely getting the benefit of the doubt. And it's, it's kind of an investment in, in their library from me. And a couple of other one-off things here and there. But this is taking two to two to three years. So at this point, you know, we are, you know, we're kind of five years into our our journey. But what's gonna happen when you start to crest that hill and you get about as many libraries as you can kind of manage, arguably, you know, and manage uh Honestly, I don't want to say it's dishonest, but I mean, if you're being honest with yourself, you're able to service these libraries in a way that they deserve to be, you know, to be to be handled and to be serviced. Feed them enough; they're finding you work, they're giving you briefs, and you're and you're answering to them. But then, on the other side of it, you actually start producing less. You start producing less. And this this is about where I'm at in my career right now. I'm on the windward side of this, where instead of cranking out five to 10 a week, now I'm maybe six, whoops, I may be six, four, three, two, And then here we are with one. And here's the big difference and the big takeaway is now, and this this is going to be, you know, another, this might be another two to three years. Or longer. I mean, these, not to scale necessarily. But by the end, you aren't, only able to write one cue a week, but huh, you only have to write one cue a week because you know through your relationships with the libraries, through what you've learned all along the way, you're not guessing, you're not throwing you know spaghetti against a wall and hoping something sticks. You know that every one of those cues is going to get published. It's going to go into the li- into the library. It's going to get pitched. And there's a really good chance that it's going to make air. That's where you will end up. You will end up only needing to write one a week. You only have to write one. It's like a, your batting average in baseball. Like the, the, the more you step up to the plate, the, the better your swings get. And so now, you know, you're getting on base and then you're hitting, you're practically hitting home runs every single at bat. That's the goal, at least. You know, that's what, that's what we're trying to get to. And you're finding that you're not pitching to new libraries as much. You're always seeding things out. And part of my year of taxi is that keeping the feelers out. So I'm not putting all of my eggs in one basket. But we only have to write one. And here's the really cool thing about this is now the one you do write, you're going to spend more time on it. You're going to invest more creativity into it. The mixes are going to get better, not because you have to keep doing it, but because your whole process just kind of slows down. You become so much more methodical about it. And not slows down to a crawl. You know, you're not like spending 40 hours on one queue. But things like your mastering chain just pop out in 20 minutes, if that. Things like finding sounds might take you 
a little time, but not as long as it did when you were learning, you know, how Omnisphere works. And so you can invest more energy, more creative capital into each and every queue, which then leads them to be better, which then leads them to get published, which leads them to better placement. So it starts becoming this kind of snowball of, of output and still only focusing on writing one queue a week. So you start by writing one queue because that's all you can manage. You're learning. The more you learn, the more you're able to output, the more you need to output. The whole, this whole side of, of, of the hill, the, the leeward side, that has to happen. If you're, if you're wanting, you know, the five to eight, the eight to 10 year kind of plan, if you're wanting that to happen, then I believe this is the path you should take, you should focus on. Now, if you're okay with that whole process taking longer, that's totally okay. If you look at this diagram and at the top of the hill, after two or three years, you're, you're, I'm expecting you to write five cues a week. And you're like, I'll never be able to do that. I have kids and pets and jobs and everything. That's totally okay. Just don't necessarily expect the royalties and the back end and the sustainability of a career so that you can leave that job. Just don't expect it to happen as fast. I still believe it will happen. I believe it'll happen for you. It's happening for me. But just be, you have to be a little bit more patient with yourself. And that's okay too. That's okay too. But by the end of it, and this is what Dan is talking about. By the end of it, every single cue is a home run. Every at bat, you're crushing the ball. And that's where we're getting to, which is why at the beginning, I said, one cue a week, yes. And then no. And then yes. Because by the end, you're easing into the creative process. Yeah. I've had this kind of, this bell curve in my mind for a long time. And I, and I wanted to share it with you today, just to encourage you, wherever you are on the journey, wherever you are, encourage, encourage you that your pace, your path, all of that is completely all right. And, and I hope you are patient with yourself. And I hope you give, give yourself time to, to, to take that journey, seeing where you can improve, seeing where you can output more, where you can learn. This is exactly why 52 Qs exist. 52 Qs exist to help folks on this journey, to help folks. Folks who join the community and put their queue in a week, one queue per week, they might be on the front side of this. Totally all right. Folks who, this is just my observation, folks who join up on the Friends sub subscription, right, with the workshops and the live streams, right, they're kind of on the front end of this in general. Folks who kind of go all in on the family subscription and they're doing the Zoom, weekly Zoom feedbacks and they're doing, you know, the live streams and the office hours, they're more up here and on the windward side of their journey. Here's another very fascinating thing that, that has happened with me is as I've gotten onto the other side of this, I am finding myself getting more into the publishing side of the industry. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm all of the, the relationships I'm making with the libraries I'm working with, the relationships I'm making with other publishers, my own personal experience in the industry and the connections I've made. I'm dabbling. I'm, I'm kind of wading into this shallow end of publishing. It's really exciting. It's really exciting. And I can't wait to see where that goes next. But that takes bandwidth. That takes creative bandwidth. It takes 
time away from the day that I could be composing, but it's okay because I'm feeling good about my pace. I'm feeling good about where I'm at and knowing that each cue that I write, if I'm only managing one cue a week or two cues a week, it's okay because they're all going to make it out there. There's a really darn good chance that they're going to make air. So I can give more focus to helping other composers. Just like you, helping other composers connect with libraries and be able to uh, to, to act in a, in a publishing. And I, it's nothing that I set out to do. That wasn't the goal. It wasn't the goal of 52 Qs. It wasn't the goal of this YouTube channel. It's just happening organically. And I completely believe that the universe is arranging all those things. So at the end of each podcast, when I said the universe has amazing plans just for you, that's, this is the kind of thing I'm talking about, putting good out into the universe and not only receiving good back, but expecting good back. And kind of proof that, that, that if you focus on, on, on positivity, putting good out there, and then the whole, all these things kind of open up open up to you. I don't mean to get too like too deep into spiritual weeds or whatever, but yeah, I I believe that. And I've seen it happen for so many other people, so many other folks, you know, and and it's, it's work, you know, it's not just kind of like secret and, you know, the secret and just like, just say it. it, it requires actual work beyond just, you know, affirmations and whiteboards and all that stuff although those are part of it. But yeah, so I'm being open to those new things. And because I'm on the other side, you know, the other side of my little mountain here, I have bandwidth to do that. I have bandwidth to do that. And the royalty checks also start filling up because while you're at the top of your hill, the five to 10, the two to three year period, and three years is that's that's pretty. It's not a very conservative number for some folks. It's closer to five years. That's all right. It took me closer to five years. I'm now eight and a half years into my journey, right? And uh, so three, four, five, six. Yeah, I'm. I'm. I probably spent closer to four four years here in the uh, in the top of the bubble here, top of the curve. Probably spent closer to four years personally. I've seen some folks make that one year. <laughs> but while you're doing that and finding traction, that's when the royalties start trickling in. And it, it is a trickle at the beginning. But even though it's a trickle, man, it's motivating. It's really, it's really motivating. So when I had, when I had my 13 deliverables in one week, that was pretty fresh off the heels of a couple of slamming quarters of royalties because the snowball just started rolling. <laughs> and it feels, you know, it feels like sometimes you're pushing a snowball up the hill here <laughs> and it's a lot of work. It's a lot of rejection, a lot of learning, a lot of mistakes, but that's how we learn. We learn by doing and we get better by making mistakes. That's just the gig. But then you crest the top and then the momentum starts carrying you. Momentum starts carrying you. Does all that make sense? Does this crazy, does this crazy diagram make sense? I hope it does. I hope it does. And, uh, and, and maybe I should have had Shannon do that graphic. Maybe I should have taken her up on her offer <laughs> to, to do the graphic. But, uh, but, but yeah, what about you? How has your experience been? How was is, how is your one cue a week going? Do you write one cue a week because that's all you can manage because of time, skills, abil ability, education, whatever? Or are you on the other side and you put so much into each cue that that's all you need to manage? I should, I should leave you also with one word of warning here. A word of caution, I should say, which is, if you're several years into this and you 
don't, you know, you're not learning how to work the DAW. You're not learning about form. You're not learning how to play your instrument. But it, you're still only able to manage one cue a week. You might, you might want to check in and see if you have a, a perfectionism streak in you. Or an imposter syndrome streak. Or a fear of rejection streak. Ask yourself... If you're far along into this, where that resistance is coming from, what is keeping you from outputting beyond one cue a week? If it's not a choice, and if you know your stuff, if you know your stuff and you don't have all these library placements, right? You don't have, you know, the, the relationships. If you know your stuff and you're still not able to get past one cue a week, then that might be worth some introspection or getting with a coach, whether me or myriad other folks, Jesse Josephson, Eric Copeland, Stephen Bedall, John Meyer, all these guys. Might be worth connecting with somebody just to help you push through your resistance so that you can get on your journey cranking things out while maintaining high quality because now you're hitting a creative stride. It's almost like, like gears of a bike, you know, when, when uh, a bicycle, when you first start pedaling, you have to be in a low gear and you have to pedal really fast and, you know, you're pedaling, 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 pedaling. Then you gear up, you gear up, you gear up. And then eventually, you know, in my, my bike, I have, uh, I have three, three gears in the front and uh, seven gears in the back, right? And so there, there's a point where my momentum and my stride are such that that I need to switch to a higher gear in the front, a bigger, bigger gear, so that I can get more momentum out of less energy output or input into the gears. My stride, my pedal, my own inertia and momentum allows me to pedal at a slower pace and yet still move faster. That's exactly what's going on here. It's just creative output instead of, you know, K calories or speed on a bicycle in little funny bike shorts, which is an autobiographical statement. Yes, I have little padded bike shorts. It's one of the reasons I only do my bike uh, in the morning when the rest of the world's asleep, because nobody needs to see that. But that momentum of being in a high gear will carry you forward to you actually have to pedal slower. But as you're getting up to speed, you got to pedal fast. You might feel silly doing it, but and you're, you're, you're going really fast and there will be a point where you will, you'll say to yourself, wow, I need to go to a higher gear. I need to change gears so that I can work less and get more momentum. But I would love to hear your thoughts. Let me know in the comments below. I do read all of the comments and I do, believe it or not, make an effort to respond to those, but I absolutely, absolutely do read all of those. But I would love to hear your thoughts on it, where you are in your journey. And, um, and let me know, let me know what you think. All right, we are going to take a quick break. And when we return, when we return, we're going to be taking a listen to Funky Heist, which is a funky heist cue written by 52Q's community member, Dex Williams. But first, we're going to hear from Mrs. 52Q's Shannon Croft, who's going to tell us all about the 52Q's community and how you can join us. Hey, y'all. I'm Shannon Croft, and I want to tell you that the 52Q's podcast is made possible by viewers and listeners just like you, composers and producers who are looking for a better way to connect and collaborate. You see, 52Q's isn't just another website selling static, pre-recorded videos to a mass audience. It's a fun, vibrant, and positive community that comes together online for sharing cues, getting feedback, and discussing what's up in the production music industry. You'll find both personalized feedback and live interaction, which are the best and fastest ways to grow your skills and earn more placements. 
The best part is that the 52 Q's community is absolutely free. And when you're ready to take your career to the next level, we offer friends and family subscriptions, which unlock weekly live streams, live interactive group feedback sessions, monthly interactive workshops, and more. Head over to 52Qs.com and sign up today. And while you're there, check out our personalized feedback videos, private lessons, and of course, merch. I can't wait to see you at 52Qs.com. Right, that was Funky Heist by Dex Williams. This was sent along during our week two of uh, weekly feedback thread. Thank you so much for sending this along. Really, really appreciate it, Dex. And so I enjoyed this. Some really nice drum programming here. Uh, be, do be careful, by the way. Uh, do be careful. Looks like we had some dead air here at the top. I don't even know if we need this business. I don't, I don't know if we need the the the, uh, the clicks and everything here at the top. I wonder if we can get away with just starting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just 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 get on with it. I don't think I don't think we need to. Uh, Need to do anything, um, anything cute like with that, especially in a production music track. Uh, there were some some weird f snare flammy things going on. Yeah, some some of those flams seemed a little. That flam right there, uh, and, and Dex, I, I'm not sure, I don't know if you're a drummer, but that would be really hard to play live. That would be like two flams in a row. And uh, if it w and the, technically, I, th I think the rudiment's called like a patafla-fla, and I don't, I don't think you're programming patafla-flas. And um, th th it, 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 it's that weird kind of uncanny valley thing when you hear something done in MIDI that you wouldn't necessarily hear. I'm not, and I'm not saying that that, is impossible to play. It is possible. It's very difficult. It doesn't it just doesn't feel natural. Those those flams kind of back to back. The I think the uh, the brass programming is really nice. Yeah, there's that blah blah. blah. Uh, probably some crashes, I think, at, at the top of the phrases. Just to help signal where the, the where the song sections are. 
Yeah, like a crash right in there. You're just overall missing some crashes. As far as the mix itself, we're, we're a little, little low, which is okay, it's super transient. So we're about, you know, minus uh, 16, minus 17 integrated luffs at about minus 15, minus uh, or so, uh, as far as our RMS. And so it's, it's coming across a little quiet, and the mids. And you know what, I, I was gonna boost the mids here and I think instead of boosting the mids, it might be we just kind of tamp down the highs around 3K, 4K or so. Just, just, uh, just tamp those down just a little bit, and I think that would help. There is some weirdness going on. If we're looking, there's, uh, there's like a hiss around 17 to 18 K. I don't know if it's a hiss. It's barely above the noise floor, but it's hanging out, and there's a pretty steep drop off on the other side of that. I don't know if this is, this is a a, a low pass that's really way high up or a high high cut. But that's, that's feeling a little weird, especially as it's something's floating around. What it looks like, it looks like it might be a plug-in or something, a noise, noise plug-in or something. It's just a little weird, so I would check that out. And uh, the ending here, it feels like we just kind of stum stumbled into it, uh, into this ending. Boom, boom. Uh, I think something like ba dum ba da bum bum bow bow something like that maybe. Ba da dum dum ba dum bum, but it just, it just kind of and we're done. Uh, so I think the ending could could have been a little stronger. I did like our our sections here. The bass, the bass uh, guitar could be a little bit, a little bit more focused, and it might just need a little extra transient attack. But it feels, feels a little wumpy, maybe. There's there's that uh, blah, blah blah that pataflafla again. That's nice. No, see, we I think we could stay. Let's stay in this in this vibe. Uh, through, I keep hitting the wrong button. My apologies. And maybe build up. So, so what I mean by that is is simplify the bass the first time through. Dum ba dum bump. Hold. Don't play it. Don't play the bass here now. Play. Bum ba dum bump. Don't play the bass. And now. Bum ba dum bump. Bum ba dum bump. Bum. Bum ba dum bump. But but let's not go back into this 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 main bass riff. Yeah, I think that's gonna make this whole section through here. I think that's gonna give it a much be, uh, greater impact if you keep this section cooking through here, so that when you come back into this big, this big uh, return to A, that it really feels like we have returned from you know a breakdown section. Another thing we could do here in the breakdown is whole notes. In the bass. Boom. 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 Lots of different things, but let's not go back to the primary, the primary riff. And I think that is going to, uh, that's going to help, help us help that section and not feel like it's getting a little bit too repetitive. Well, Dex, thank you so much for sending this along. I really appreciated it. Um, the, the title, Funky Heist, it is, that's absolutely what it is, but um, I would, I'm gonna give you one of my titles if you wanna use it. I have a cue that uh, is similar to this, 
and it's called We're Gonna Rob a Bank. And uh, and so uh, you you can have that title, but the title "Funky Heist" is a little uh, it's a little plain Jane, it's a little vanilla. It works, but we're in dangerous territory of titling something what it is versus a title that's gonna that's gonna help help out. Now, if you're gonna send this up to like the stock music exchanges uh, marketplaces. I, they they do really well uh, when you just title them what they are. Tension cue, but um, but as far as libraries wanting this, yeah, I I think uh, I think I think a, a title that's that's gonna help help sell it a little bit more. And then speaking of, we're gonna rob a bank. If you really want to go full Ocean's Eleven vibe, you know that kind of um, that kind of early two thousand z vibe. Layer layer in some breakbeat loops. Um, that could be, that could be really cool. So, like I said, this was sent along during our, a week, our week two, uh, weekly feedback thread. We put weekly feedback threads up every week that it's free to join. Why don't you, why don't you come over, come over to 52Qs.com, sign up for free, post your own queue and you might, who knows, you might get featured on the podcast. And by the way, if this is something that you feel would be helpful for your own cues, then why don't you head over to 52cues.com slash coaching and order up your own feedback video where I will break down your cue, look at the EQs, look at the mix, look at your mastering, talk about your titles, talk about the form, maybe the music theory side of things and all of that. Once again, head over to 52Qs.com slash coaching. And while you're there, you can also book a one-on-one -on -one Zoom session with me or uh, sign up to be on the waiting list for our next mastermind, which is coming up in the spring. But that's going to do it for me this week. You want to join us next week where I will be talking about the most basic tenets, the basic principles that guide production music. The rules, if you will, or they're, I guess they're more like guidelines, but the most basic guidelines that govern nearly all production music. So you absolutely want to stick around for that. Once again, I want to give a special word of thanks to the friends, family, and patrons of 52Qs who help keep everything going. Just know that I love you and I appreciate you. But that's going to do it for me. I hope that you had a fantastic week too, and I hope your 2023 is going great. And I know that your week three is gonna be great. And how do I know that, friends? I know that because the universe, I believe and trust, has amazing plans just for you. Until next time, peace. The 52 Cues podcast is copyright 2023 at 18 Studios, all rights reserved. The music played on the podcast is copyright of their respective owners and is used with permission and for educational purposes only. For more information, including joining the community and submitting your cue for consideration on the podcast, head over to 52Cues.com. <laughs>